Welcome to another In Memoriam episode of Debt to Cinema. This is me being original and trying to stay topical, and also being reminded that I haven't seen everything, and that's the point of the show, isn't it? But this one is in respects to Michael Cimino, the director who just passed away last week, and this is his 1980 epic western, which was, and still is, regarded as one of the biggest flops of all time. Of course, I'm talking about Heaven's Gate, the one that is responsible for bankrupting United Artists, ruining the new Hollywood system, and then also putting the director in a filmmaker's jail despite winning Oscar gold just a year prior to its release. It's really a shame, too, because there's a lot to love here. It's magnificent in scope and scale. It's beautiful. The, the music is amazing. I truly love certain sequences, and, and yet it's not an amazing film. But the cast, you got Jeff Bridges, you, you got uh, Chris Christopherson, Brad Dorif, um, who else? There's so many in this. Sam Waterston, John Hurt. You really have to see it, and that's why this show exists. But it's also worth noting before I finish up here, it's a death double feature. Uh, Vilmo Sigmund, who was director of photography for this, he died at the beginning of this year too. And by having since we picked The Long Goodbye a couple of months ago. And, you know, he did both of those. He's also known for Woody Allen stuff and also Kevin Smith to a lesser extent. But you deserve to watch this one. Don't let the critics scare you away. Don't be afraid of the box office numbers because there's going to be a wave about it and people are going to love it. But welcome to Death Cinema. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Stephen Maltmanex. Like most people, we love going to the theater and catching latest releases. However, you can sadly put a big dent in your wallet. Fortunately, living in the digital age makes the viewing possibilities endless from the comforts of home. Many of these films that you can see right from your couch, we're ashamed to say we miss, despite labeling ourselves cinephiles. So join us as one or both of us cross off a title from our list of shame. It can be an all-time essential classic. Or an underrated piece of cinema that's worth giving a shot. Hell. It might just be some trashy film we want the other's opinion on. So sit tight and join us as we pay off our debts, one dollar at a time. I guess we kind of had to watch this movie eventually, right? Uh, this is debt to cinema. Forget Michael Cimino dying this <laughs> past week. I feel like it's a bit premature for me, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm glad that I got this out of the way now. Right? Because we, we pick a lot of things on this, like our last couple of movies, we would fucking like Odd Thomas, The Thin Man. Oh, Thin Man is yeah. a good example of the show. But we kind of are fast and loose with the selections. They generally are just something we want to see. Or it's just perfect Kingpin. timing, yeah. Um, fucking Freddy got fingered, whereas I, I think that this is a great example. Also, like, you know, Kingdom Heaven, mm -hmm. um, but uh, following too. But there's only a couple of true selections that we've done on the show that I feel the name, like, necessitates. It's like, I had to see this for a reason. I've learned about it for, like, a decade almost now. But, I mean, th I think this goes beyond that. Like, there's some things in here that just echo recent history and just such a you know such a terrible way i mean it, this, it's kind of like how you picked bullworth and mm -hmm. i i just you know it's a good movie at the end of the day but i just felt like it hit too close to home that my experience watching it was just me being purely cynical on real life issues and, and this sort of like that but i don't hmm. think any of that is going to have to do really with the criticism here because without getting like having an opinion on it yet i think at the end of the day this is a very thought-provoking movie at least on class warfare and just immigration and you know taking in refugees and you know having you know there's a party right like this is happening especially after uh paris and you know trying to take in syrian refugees here and you know a, a certain party trying to go against this movie that and, is you know, it's a lot of things yeah. it's an epic but at the heart of it it's like you said it's it's about feudal warfare in the wild west at the dawn of modern society mm -hmm. and like the, the immigrant experience in the frontier and just the power of the super rich having over mm -hmm. that even like uh, the, the most ridiculous crimes here that like some of these people are on for a death list yeah. for no reason whatsoever I mean, it's just because the super rich want them gone and that's stuff that we are still seeing today which is depressing but I, I, I will say this like you know this movie yeah it is a good thought provoking example of that and it realizes that world really well but 
and uh, you know where I'm going with this, right? Maybe not. Do we feel do we you. feel the same about this? I, I really like this movie. Okay, well, can we? I, I think we gotta get, get this down first because um, there's several cuts of this movie. Did you see the Criterion director's cut? Yes, I okay. saw the Criterion director's cut. The way you can tell it's that, besides the length and it starting with the Criterion logo, is that the foreigners, the what I think they're Russian, they don't have subtitles whenever when they're talking in their native language. All right, well, there's no subtitles in mine either, but I got this. Yeah, we should have seen the same cut. I got this off Amazon Instant, and it started with the MGM logo and the United Artists logo, and it was 219 minutes long. So from what I yeah, can gather. Too. Uh, yours, well, apparently the Criterion cut is um, 216 minutes. Oh, yeah, you must yeah. have seen the radial cut. I, and what I had was, I had an intermission in between. I don't know if you did. No, no Okay, yeah, so from what I can figure, what I had was either the initial premiere release, uh, according to Wikipedia, or what's called as the radical cut. Yeah. And they both I have think a 219. No, I, think it's, uh, I think it's radial. No, it's his radical cut. Um, I'm looking at it right now, but from what I can tell, it's maybe those two are the same thing. Just the intermission. Yeah. But I don't know how substantial the stuff in the middle is here. Like that might be cut out because I think there's just a few bits of, according to the, I guess the Criterion release. Okay, it takes out the intermission. It's slightly shortened on some cuts in there, but I think we may have basically seen the same movie, and this one really really has a lot of stuff that could have been trimmed on there i really like i said i i really enjoyed most of this with you know despite not liking epics like i said in the intro mm -hmm. that if i cut off the first 30 minutes of this film and the final 10 i think it would be a great film but it kind of suffers in the same way the witches does where it just kind of <laughs> goes overboard once you get to the true ending and i was like what the fuck did i just watch well, like I, I was of, almost the exact mad opposite because actually my favorite stuff in this movie like the stuff that actually sticks with me the most is in mm -hmm. that first like 20 20 to 30 minutes really? and i think you know even though i wasn't that into the rest of it i think the ending lent a bit more substance for me because i mean that opening it's kind of like um, the same way that Deer Hunter opened, where you just knew that things after that were going to go down south. Deer Hunter opens with a wedding, everybody's happy, there's spilt red wine on the dress, which is, of course, symbolism for bad things are going to happen. And uh, here I've only you seen have. Deer Hunter once, and I, I didn't have uh, the greatest <laughs> opinion of it. All right, now, yeah, now I was much more into Deer Hunter, and I. But I mean, going with this, like, you know, there's the John Hurt graduation speech right after the Reverend, which I thought was kind of funny, even though his views he seemed to like to me to have like changed considerably within the 20 year gap in the film but i mean yeah you just know that things are going to go to shit then you just get to the rest of it and it just feels way too passive to me like you're not that into epics but whether it's especially kingdom of heaven but if it's lawrence of arabia or dr Vago. There's usually a great sense of a character changing from where we saw them at the beginning to where they end up, and you go on this journey with them, and you really feel that change as you go. This one has, like, gaps in time where it's just like, I, I see that they went somewhere, but I didn't go on that journey with them, and I'm watching them through this middle section where they're incredibly passive throughout the whole time, and there's this great point in the middle of it that gives you things to think about. But it's not really affecting the character in a substantial way where they are experiencing this event that's happening. And there's no room for me to connect it with it in any way whatsoever. And so that really just kind of makes the movie boring for me. I mean, I, especially like um, I know you're going to see it in epic it. that way at all. I, I see this just an epic in terms of the scope of it. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is not a single set here. Every single set, every single place they shoot was created for the film, whether that be a huge ass cabin oh, yeah. or a warehouse or the fucking roller rink, uh, all the farmland, how beautiful it is, how much magic hour shots there are. Um, the fact that they, they had three editors cut this thing, that Vilmo Zygmunt, you know, mm -hmm. uh, shot it. Uh, Michael Cimino had carte blanche, like the, everything about it, every wardrobe choice, everyone stands out. It's like, Watching this is the equivalency of binge watching an entire season of a TV show. Like it is that much of a time commitment. Like See, you're that's... not getting breaks, and you get to know all of these characters, and it ends up, you know, it it's not as emotional as it could be at the end because this is a true story. This this movie was created when the director 
um, you know, found out about uh, this this war that happened in Wyoming in 1890, and he created a story from that. And the fact that this isn't adapted, mm-hmm. there are a couple of characters that are real here: Nate Champion, um, Chris Christopherson's character, and then also Ella Watson. They are all three real character, real people who are you know fictionalized. But I, you know, I didn't really love any of them. I didn't really care for any of them. I and I didn't also see it as a journey, but I cared about the town and about these people and this imposing doom that was coming to them. Well, that's I think thing. more I mean, so I... just because it's pretty. <laughs> it's a real fucking pretty movie, and yet it looks like it's old. I mean, it looks it is, like it's from 1890s almost. It, it's a gorgeously shot movie, and you got the better uh, transfer than I did. I actually paid for the HD streaming, and it, I swear it was an SD upconvert that I got, so it looked like shit anyway. And I may as well have just watched the SD version. But honestly, like, first off, I mean, this romance is so paper thin. It's like, nah, it's you know, fucking the, stupid. The, yeah, the thing yeah. is, though, the reason that you have that there, especially in an epic like this, is to connect more with these characters when the shit goes down and like it just feels like no one was interested here it felt way too passive to me although i think just thinking about it now having a full day to process it maybe that's the point for averil is that especially with where he ends up at the end of the movie it just seems like a guy that is stuck living in the past he's so happy at the beginning and then you have john hurt just telling him right as they're celebrating hey it's over and then from there on out everything sucks you get okay, to the you're very... bringing you're bringing up the beginning again. I tried to watch this movie like three days ago, mm-hmm. and after that Harvard or was it Yale, whatever, it's actually Harvard. filmed it's at Cornell, so it doesn't fucking <laughs> matter. But after that opening graduation sequence, like I said, it's like 25 minutes or something. I fell asleep, oh, man. straight up. I went to sleep, and then I woke up, you know, the next day, and I tried again, and I watched the rest of the movie, the 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 other three hours, the actual film. And that's, I think, why I really didn't like it. Because almost all of John Hurt's dialogue... First off, it's not dialogue. The, the film starts for 30 minutes without any dialogue. It's all monologues. There's two series of them. It's an unimportant. You don't there get any characterization. There, though. Glances and shit, mm-hmm. but no one's talking to one another. They're just speaking. It's it's like a soliloquy almost. Like Yes, I it might set that. up the rest of the movie, but... Chris Christopherson doesn't say a damn thing. He just smiles. That's all you get. You get these looks of him looking at the girl who he loves, who's, like, never mentioned but shown very much throughout the movie in mm-hmm. photos and, like, cutaways. And that's and then, the thing. You know, it it, and it also just the gets prologue. to that point, though, of just, like, them being nostalgic for this time and the way that things were. And, I mean, that's that's the most that you get of a journey for Chris Christopherson's character of him changing throughout the movie, not necessarily... I think enough people say things about him that he doesn't need a journey. The fact that, like, I, well, the, I, the way see, that I the made is, the, I mean, the epilogue makes sense to me because it it uh, not just set up sets up, but shows that at one point Averill was in fact you know rich and came from a good family mm-hmm. and has wealth, and that's important for the the whole feudal system fight here that happens later on in the association and the cattle ranchers and all that and his point in it you know you have that scene that kind of gets the movie rolling when he shows up to that association they tell him like, oh you've been blackballed like you're not allowed to be here anymore mm-hmm. and you get that very short exchange the only time john hurt and chris christopherson have a moment together which really yeah, which was you know, a really good scene a really great scene it sets up the whole movie you're like mm-hmm. okay well they're friends we know that from the beginning here's he's got the inside dirt now he can try to change it as in the town since he's the sheriff or the marshal or he's the law okay mm-hmm. and that little exchange there you know when they're drunk and most people are drunk throughout this whole movie <laughs> um that kind of got me interested and then it's also the cast you know i sold this on you for you know oh it's you know, Tevin's game we got to see it and yeah. it's Michael Cimino but oh my god every single person in this even if they're not in for long you might not know the name but you know who they are I mean like Jeff Bridges Chris Christopherson John Hurt yeah fucking Willem Christopher Dafoe Walken. Sam I mean, Watterson um wait, Brad Dourif in this he's in the cockfight for like a second he's not even listed but it's <sighs> his first movie um we have Brad Dourif uh, Mickey Rourke is in it for about five minutes. Um, like there so are people, people here that have great moments, but mm-hmm. then there's like there's just all these long stretches of I mean, you know that like there's this long long ass scene where they're dancing or I I mean you I know, love that scene. Oh my god, it took forever, and I just I wasn't connecting with anybody at that point. I understand that you know we know that this impending doom is coming, and 
when you have an epic like this, that's typically how it goes. As you know, First you, off, you show the movie... them in their happiest moments before shit goes downhill. But, you know, for moments like that, I'm supposed to have that time to connect with characters and to get to know them. But it just, it, I mean, it was way too passive for me and there was nothing charming there for me. And I mean, I get that this movie is not doing that, but it really is alienating. And I can see why a lot of people would hate this movie. Although then again, we no. did not see the... Uh, the uh, chop to bits cut were which you know people I guess criticized that one for being very incoherent and you didn't know what was going on that certainly is not the case here I knew what was going on it's just it went on very 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 long to the point it's where a, it's a very it's not a long like, it is long yeah. in the traditional sense of the word but it, it it's not slow it's just it's I felt it, it was has very, like I felt this would have been better as a mini series honestly yeah like I said it's it's like binge watching a TV show but, but it I, was just way too paper thin from a character standpoint that I honestly felt no reason to have Christopher walk in there other than for the sake of having a love triangle but like fucking Pearl Harbor had a more interesting love Fuck triangle no. than this, honestly. Fuck no. As cheesy as it was, at least no. it was one that like I'm sorry. made sense. There's in full the frontal nudity level. here. And what so is that? I was more interested in the love triangle. That's your justification. The the woman involved is the the madam of a whorehouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so that just on paper makes it more interesting. Yeah, but why Christopher Walken needed to be there did not make it interesting. He needed to be there because he was horny in the frontier and he went to the whorehouse to get pussy. That's why he was there. Uh -huh. And then he fell in love with the madam. I mean, I guess as men are wont to do. It just did not move anything forward in a way that I felt was interesting. It doesn't say anything interesting about human relationships Let, let's or back anything track. at all. But let's b back up. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to this, especially the dance. I want to talk about that. Um, we haven't talked about the history of this movie, which is something I knew, as I said earlier, for, for years and years, probably like a decade now. You know, New Hollywood was a thing in the, the late 60s and to early totally 80s. it totally killed that movement. It totally killed it. So, you know, in this era, it, it's when the director became a person. It's when the auteur theory became accepted by mm -hmm. the, the mass audience. You got people like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola, Scorsese, all the people whose names we still know, and you go to the movies to see a film that they made. It's all those people. You, you, to a lesser extent, you know, people like Oliver Stone, you know, Robert Altman. It, Brian De Palma. The, Brian De Palma. They created the artistry behind the name. And so we, we moved from a Hollywood system, the vertical integrated classical era, to this, this new Hollywood where everything is hip, you got stuff like Easy Rider, uh, artists have more freedom to make the movies they want to make, it's a personal story, it's something that's important, that's why Deer Hunter's, you know, kind of groundbreaking in Hollywood, in 1979, it won not only Best Director and Best Picture, but it also, you know, Christopher Walken got an Oscar, Meryl Streep got one, mm -hmm. So United Artists was going to take any chance they could on this guy. Michael Cimino, like, he went overnight to being, like, the biggest name in Hollywood. Like, of course you're going to make a fucking movie with him. <laughs> so he gets carte blanche. He can do whatever he wants. He has Final Cut. It, it is his movie. And he ends up shooting, like, over a million feet of film. He goes... Huh, just like Judd Apatow when he made The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Maybe, yeah. It was like, like he, a million feet. Like, are you sure it's that long? I, I it could be longer for all I know. I think but, it's a million and a half. Yeah, I mean, because um, the first cut of this movie was like five, five hours, hours and twenty minutes uh -huh. long or something. Apparently, the the war scene at the end of this movie was like an hour and a half oh, in the cut wow. that he showed the studio. <laughs> and he was the one. Like, there's like all these stories. I need to find this book. That's and gotta read be it. really boring after the, a while. Yeah, the book was actually written by the the studio head of uh, of United Artists. So mm -hmm. it's very real like it's it's like the perfect um what should we call it story behind this this failed production but there's stories of like oh uh, samino wasn't satisfied with the spacing on the houses and so they had to tear them down and recreate them <laughs> or uh like that bullwhip scene which is fucking awesome and even though it lasts like two seconds if that there's like 50 takes of that and just like total perfectionist this this production was happening at the same time apocalypse now was and so they called this apocalypse next like in the trades and just everything about it was was crazy it's like when dances with wolves was being filmed oh they called that uh, uh kevin's gate 
<laughs> like it, it totally became a thing. Like if, if the internet existed back then, it would have been amazing. Oh, yeah, no, like even uh, Titanic, like they spelled Doom for it a similar way, like mm-hmm. probably like this. I'm sure it got the same type of publicity because people were expecting that to fail in the same way, and of course, it ended up being the biggest movie yeah, ever yeah, like at all that time. Point. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, honestly, this was the last thing I was thinking about because that was my main association with Heaven's Gate. Yeah. So you know, hearing that the director's cut came out what was it like three four years ago and that it's very well received by a bunch of people i just did not want any of that context um it's funny this coming in when i was watching the movie i just wanted to judge it as a movie but it was very clear right away that it was very expensive but no like during these scenes i wasn't thinking like you know oh this is why it tanked or this why they hated it Mm -hmm. because it's so slow and boring i I was somewhat invested in the imagery on screen and you know i mean this world definitely looks fully realized yeah it's just i can't connect with anybody in it because they just don't seem to care and that's that's a totally fair criticism i I mean i'm not experience not uh that valuable to me I didn't walk away caring about any of these characters. I'm never going to bring them up in conversation. Like, oh, yeah, I, I totally love the way that so-and-so handled that situation. It's I I think my – and I wasn't viewing it with the, with the tinted goggles of, oh, why did this go wrong? Let me make notes of everything that's wrong with it. It's, it was just in the back of my mind. Like, I picked it for a reason. And critics have be, kind of turned the tide because when this came out, it wasn't just – a huge flop but it also was panned by critics like every single critic no one liked it had like if the tomato meter existed back then it probably would have got like a five percent or something crazy <laughs> and it made no money yeah but then and again it, they it, saw a much shorter cut that was chopped to no, shit. no they like, didn't no yeah, the, no, no, the, no, no, no 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 the, the original uh, release it was in two cities it was in new york and la it played for about a week mm-hmm. and no one saw it and who did the people that did see it those were the 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 reviews and then yeah the the week after that it got like a hundred minutes cut off of it and no one's seen that version it was never put on out on home video no no it's it's out it was out in uh france and that's um, in france but yeah. i mean like in in the western like in the english-speaking territory but you could okay? find no it seen easily it. online now i wouldn't want to no I, I wouldn't either but normally i would love like i might in the future try to find that cut and then i might no. even no, seriously, I'm, and I might even watch it again because I am fascinated by stuff like this when there's different versions of a movie out there and when people tend to criticize, like, you, you know, especially with Batman versus Superman, which... I'm gonna, I, we're gonna do an yeah. episode for it. I, I've been, I, maybe I've waited. I have to watch the theatrical cut a, as well just to see the difference, but I'm usually the fascinated. Ray, like I am and watch both. <laughs> We'll, we'll I don't do an if, episode for I don't the know director's if I'll cut. Buy it. I might oh, just, not the director's uh, cut. It, I can lend you like my ultraviolet account, and you can watch my really? copy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I mean this, like, just you know, I am fascinated by different versions, and some of our best episodes, like, I mean, you know, Kingdom of Heaven or even Daredevil, like, yeah, th- those do really affect the quality of a film a lot. But I'm also, I might be curious to revisit this one in the future just to see if I was missing something or what, what's if funny I'm about... just more prepared for it later on. Just, but honestly like this did not connect with me at all like what's and funny I mean, about this though in relation to mm-hmm. those two movies that this kind of created the director's cut just how big like there obviously were people out there that saw the the shortened version well first but then, it, was, it was also mainly it was blade runner that was the one that well, really got the ball yeah, that, that too that. but i mean blade runner came out like three years after this did yeah but this one um, took forever for the criterion one to come out and i don't it wasn't really till a few years ago that people really reevaluated this movie well, in my research, I saw that there that radical cut or radial or whatever version you got that exists on Laserdisc. Radical. Yeah, it existed on Laserdisc, so you know it was out on home media forever mm-hmm. ago. But we were talking about you know the death of New Hollywood and what it meant, and directly after this film's you know failure, that's when the Hollywood system, the blockbuster like mentality, came into full force. This same year, you know, Empire Strikes Back, Back came out. Um, Spielberg's in full force. I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is like the next year. Um, Only four years later, Back to the Future comes out. Like, it's it's crazy how big a difference this huge budget movie has from these acclaimed films that people still, you know, part of the pop culture lexicon. And it it seems like it's a whole nother millennia, just the production values and how much is here that makes it seem like an epic 
even if the characters ultimately aren't important and they're, you're never going to talk about them. Like, you know, this isn't a Jane Austen novel. It's not Gone with the Wind. And then again, then again, I was thinking about Gone with the Wind a lot when I was watching this because, in my opinion, this is a much more interesting movie. Um, I think that's also because of like the whole reconstructionism. In terms of scale, yeah, I think this is probably bigger and more grander than Gone with the Wind. Not to say that Gone with the Wind isn't impressive on that front, but it's just a different kind of impressive. Oh yeah, I mean, almost every shot of this movie looks just gorgeous, incredibly like, like expensive. The... I mean, just the amount of extras that they have out there yeah, dancing, always. The day, it's like. Uh, right away when they're walking into mm-hmm. that uh, graduation room, like I mean, running, so actually. many great shots in there, and it's just like holy shit! <laughs> this like I I can already see like where the money is going. Well, that's what's funny though. The epilogue and prologue were actually shot after principal photography was completed, so they shot the bulk of the movie, the so middle of the like movie. So it feels like they dumped way more into the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it wow. was like that. That cost like seventy million or something, and then well, in their money, like thirty. And then after that, they were satisfied, and they told him, like, oh, you can go shoot your prologue and epilogue. It has to cost less and less, and you have to shoot it for this amount of days. No no more, no less. And so then he was able to do it. Because, I mean, the epilogue, it does set up everything. But then the prologue, just that yacht alone had to cost, like, a million dollars. The coolest yacht ever. The, I don't know. There's a lot here. You were talking about dancing earlier, and you keep mm-hmm. on bringing up the Blue Denby. My favorite thing of the movie... And it had to be Michael Cimino's, too, because the film is titled Heaven's Gate, Mm -hmm. which has, like, really no meaning other than the fact that that's the name of the roller rink. It's the main thing in town. You have these, like, signs on it where it's like, it's a moral and fun excursion or something like that. But just the way you're kind of introduced to it with that fiddler on the roller skates whose name is David Mansfield, and he single-handedly composed the entire film score and recorded all the instruments himself. So he has this really amazing, probably one of the best things in cinema, in my opinion, where he's on roller skates, skating around, doing like complicated maneuvers while playing on his fiddle. He doesn't have a single line of dialogue in the movie. He plays through, like, he talks through his music... And he's got, just I think he's that got like scene. a few moments where like he's answering the door or something. But I don't think I don't think he says anything. I think he just talks with his I music. I, and maybe, I love I th- I that sequence. He, saw, he said something, but I love that sequence so much. How he like gets everyone excited on the roller rink, and you know you mentioned it a, a couple of minutes ago about mm-hmm. how like it, you know it's the the final moment of happiness before doom strikes the town. But even still. Uh, there is like a parallel between that and also the opening dance after the the graduation, mm-hmm. that where it's like, well, dancing kind of spells something bad's gonna happen. I, I was real sad in that there wasn't a third dance moment, um, but every yeah, just everything about that roller rink, like I I loved it so much, and it's funny because the shot directly after that skating, it literally goes grim, like it's shot at night. It's the first nighttime shot of the film. And it's like clouds are moving in on the uh, the town and making it dark. Mm-hmm. And then directly after that, Christopher Walken's character shows up, and it's it's dark yet again. And he's wearing dark clothing, and he's going to the whorehouse. And it's just like, ooh, things went spooky. Because before that, it's very not happy go lucky, but for the most part, you know, it's it's pretty either cheerful, I guess I could say, or kind of whimsical. Like it, it just feels like a day in the past like you're kind of going along with this law and there's no conflict or anything besides like you know this little moment you have with the association but for the most part that first hour of the movie uh, it's like oh this is like a, a little fun this is why it's called heaven's gate because it's it's paradise right uh, and then it, it gets real real grim really fast i mean see i can see why you enjoyed it just i really wish i was on the same page with you because i just felt you know, really bored. Like uh, something like you know, even the wedding scenes in the first Godfather or the party in um, at the at the beginning in the second one. Like that, those I could get into, especially those little moments in dancing. But there's that's because there's so much other stuff peppered in there. Whereas this was just watching people be joyful for a long time, which mm-hmm. you, you know, I, I guess is fine. But they were people that I was just not invested in at all, even after, you know, the whole horse and carriage scene and all that, like, it, just those yeah, little ag- weird. interactions weird with, scene. like, uh, Avril and Ella. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, that's another thing. You said you liked this town. I did not connect with anybody. Like, I really wish that I got a better sense of who the people in this town were. Like, I know that Avril, you know, he stays in town, but it feels more like 
he's there as a sense of obligation rather than just because he knows and cares for these people even though like he knows who mm. they are but I, I never both. I never feel like I got the sense to really know who any of them are when you get to that name where they're reading all the not, <laughs> when you yeah, get to that scene list, where yeah. they're reading the death list going through so many names I'm just kind of I, I see why they're upset but I just don't feel it and you know it's going through so many names and it feels repetitive over and over and over again like there's going to be a freak out over every single name and I just don't feel like any of these people like like there was any emotional investment there I was just kind of like okay they're going to name someone that's going to die and it's going to be tragic but I don't feel like I should care every time that they just cry even louder and louder and louder and I, I like I, I, I'm, I'm just kind of like that guy you know in the court that judge with the hammer that just wants to shout out order in the court like uh, you know what good is it going to do every time he brings up a name you know that it's going to be terrible but I, th- I that's just, my like, cynicism I, getting in when I'm watching it but it's just like I really I I really wanted to connect with something and I couldn't I didn't watch for that reason in the same way when I, yeah, I know, whenever I watch an epic I don't I don't try to do that. Like that's what the like, ninety minute movies for. The I, smaller well, the movie, the the more the less the characters. The no, more no, I, the I disagree. Mean. I mean, like even for long, I think you got to connect with at least something. Like I saw Lawrence of Arabia. I didn't give a fuck about anyone. Okay. Not I mean, T. See, T. Lawrence, I got a sense of Lawrence's not journey. No I mean, one. Well, here's the thing. Like, there's if you're watching a movie, like I mean, you know, like the but the biggest thing that could invest you into a movie or immerse me, like you know, first off, it is characters. It's got nothing to do with runtime. It's just I have to, like, at least, you know, get invested. And a way of doing that is seeing a character be invested in something. Averill does not seem that invested in these people. He just seems very, very, pa- like, passive to me. And, like, he's just kind of doing it well, because is, he feels he has to. And that might give you, you gotta remember, something to... We like, know Chris Christopherson for mm-hmm. being Whistler and Blade. That's what he's best known for. I've seen him in other stuff, actually. He, he's um, in I, other stuff, but I'm saying, like, that's... Yeah. It, it, Joe that's Schmo, that was not my introduction to him, though. Joe Schmo, I think that's what he's most recognized for. It's it's the thing that's going to have the the most lasting, like, cultural yeah. impact. That's okay? one thing, though. I mean, yeah, and you're bringing up a character that's like that, but that is a supporting character. That's well, not uh, your lead character. Well, that's not my point. My point is, he was kind of you know Elvis or Justin Bieber. He had a musical mm-hmm. career. You know, yeah. he was famous for that, and then he decided to try. Well, he acting. did the remake of uh, A Star Is Born. Yeah, um, he did. He yeah. did that. Um, but he was in a lot of things, mostly as you know, a, a Western character or country singer or or something along those lines. And so this was, you know, it's kind of like Drake or Justin Bieber being the star of this movie so i don't fault him for not being that emotional and then again no, no, i don't fault the, him. He's, a, he's a good actor i uh-huh. i'm faulting the script i'm not saying it's his fault at what all because he's been really i mean that's there, the thing there's like, no there, scripts there's, here yeah, there's no characterization here and they're not really given much like, to work with that's, that's not thing. why i'm watching the. i that's, watched that's the movie my fault for this movie though like i, I walk mean, i knew it was gonna be probably bad and that's why i picked it i was interested to see how bad it was but I didn't think it was bad at all. I think it had bad moments. I didn't agree with everything. Like I said earlier, I, I didn't like the first 30 minutes. I didn't like the last 10. Not just the prologue, what happens right before it. Um, but I enjoyed the music so much, the way it was shot, the cutting style, and just everything about the production design. In addition to certain moments like the roller rink and uh, the, the horse and uh, buggy um, that kind of funny Nate Champion scene, uh, the cockfight, for instance. It's like you follow up Russian roulette with a cockfighting scene. Uh, but I think it, more so out of all of those things, it's just seeing, you know, I have a Slavic background. Mm-hmm. Uh, like my grandfather and his family wa- was from uh, Poland. And so to see people that share my ancestry, even if it's just fake for a movie, and kind of having some kind of connection to what my ancestors could have gone through if they landed in Wyoming instead of Chicago. Yeah. Like I I was more invested just seeing something that I knew was true and yeah, even if it's in terms of the political landscape that it, it shares with concurrently, I just I was drawn in for some reason. Like it seemed like a story that I needed I needed to know because this this movie isn't about the love triangle. Or, no, but it spends or, a lot of time in it. And it does, because that's how it tries to invest you, the yeah. viewer, especially just 
the average you know film goer but yet it doesn't do anything with it like it, it gets it gets so much time to get, get like get it, you invested if you think this is more bad, than any other movie like no, in the planet no. does this gets like Sh- more than an hour you to need do it, to and watch it reds it. reds is a boring as fuck movie where all that happens is dialogue and the love triangle is jack nicholson warren Beatty, and diane keaton like that is the love triangle there's nothing happens in that movie. You said Jack Nicholson. Like I can't yeah. imagine that being that terrible. I mean, you could, I like, everyone Jack loves it. Jack Nicholson is one of my favorite actors. It, so it I came out. Be more invested in it that. It came out a year after this. It's pretty similar. It's a historical movie. It, it's about communism, though. And I just remember someone bringing it over to my house. She was like, "Oh, I love Warren. I love Jack Nicholson, or I love Warren Beatty, or whatever." And she made me watch it. And it was like the most bored I've ever been ever during a movie like it was i i'll watch it again at some point in my life and you know maybe it was like oh i don't care for epics but no just i i did not like it and that movie compared to this one like they're very similar Mm -hmm. like besides the historical accuracy and the love triangle just the scope of it in the runtime like they're very similar movies and i think the only reason why this one is considered a shit saint on cinema is for the way it kind of ended an era of filmmaking, the expectation of it doing well, and then more so kind of, you know, the things that you got problems with, that it's not that interesting, that the characters aren't fully calculated, that the love uh, triangle isn't the best one you've ever seen. But I was satisfied enough, like, in today's day and age, that if a blockbuster, or not even a blockbuster, but if an epic was made of this link today, you know, it'd be like Justice League or mm-hmm. or, or something like that. Where and even then, though, I mean, that had like, especially because it's Justice League, you have so many mm-hmm. characters that you have yeah. to invest in. You have to you invest have in that to. group. Superheroes save people, so you have to care about the danger that's happening. Uh, with this, I, d- I don't know. Should we? D- do you have a few more things that you want to say, or should I start closing? No, I, up? Just, I just liked a lot about this. I mean, I, the, I, I didn't think it was bad. I just, well, I don't it, think it's, I don't think it's bad. It's just. You know, here's the thing. I mean, especially if you're making an epic, then you're giving people, you have to give them something to experience in some way. Like, I mean, let's just, I mean, I've not seen Deer Hunter in forever, but that movie is a journey. And it's a journey I remember where it's a journey these characters, to the Russian roulette scene. <laughs> it, no, I mean, they, they start out, <laughs> I'll get to that. They start out, like, you know, in a very happy place on a high note. And they are also excited to go off and fight for their country. You get to that Russian roulette scene where it has a major time shift, but you're fully invested in them at that moment, and then how they, all the shit that they go through in between then, you I, feel that there has been so much that has happened right when that Russian roulette scene happens. And I think it's just how it, masterful that scene by well, itself it's, is. That that, if yeah, you no, didn't watch the rest of the movie and you just watch that, just how tense it is and how know, well it's but, lit I mean, that's and the thing, just like, the acting, everything about that scene is so good that it makes the movie. But that's the thing. You're invested in their happiness at the beginning, and then you I don't, get to that I scene. I don't know. When I saw I, okay, it, I, I don't I, remember okay, that. My, my experience is that I was like invested. like I you know I, <laughs> In a very similar way where this movie was starting to get me there and then you put these characters in a very very dangerous place and you really feel like you are in that moment this movie doesn't have that like at all i mean and that's not saying that it should but it's just it establishes these characters and then it puts them in the middle of a journey that doesn't really affect them personally and it affects a whole other group of people and I think I see at the end of the day what the movie is trying to do and I respect it for it because at the very least like you know even if a movie like what a movie should do is one of three things to me is that it should make you feel it should entertain you or it should make you think um and and, you know at at the very least this movie made me think and so you know that is giving me giving it credit that you know there is absolutely thought put into this like this isn't a total piece of garbage at Mm -hmm. all to me but I did not, I was not entertained, I did not feel anything, and usually when you feel something, it's because you are able to, in some way, relate to, or at least be able to sympathize or empathize characters on this journey, and it really, this is not, this was not a pleasant, or, I mean, not an unpleasant experience, it just was one that really did not resonate with me in any other way, so I don't, you know, I, I don't really feel like for me, like there was much value here, 
but I still am glad I saw it, and I'm pretty sure I will be compelled to revisit this in the future, because this is like one of those cases where it was a lot like Knight of Cups, in that I'm just kind of falling <laughs> around these characters that are so passive and are really j- just seem so out of touch and so jaded. Except uh, Knight you know, of Cups except, has no structure. Yeah, and, and there, there is th- that's much more like, you know, 21st century rich guy trying to connect with something and is just being whiny the whole time. This is like, at least there's like larger circumstances happening in there. Like there's things that are happening in that world. But I, you know, I want to, um, I, every time I see something like this, it's like, I do think I will revisit it because I want to like it so bad. I want to connect with it in some way. And I think maybe the point might have more significance to me later on, you know, because yeah, this is undeniably beautiful to look at, but I just, I need something more than that. That, that, I, that isn't enough for me. I wasn't entertained by this. And I don't think that's the necessary. Well, but I just like, fa- I, sh- I should be experiencing something, and I should sure. be taking something let, let away me, from it. Let me get my thing in here, though. I, I didn't have to be entertained because I was engrossed. I at no point was bored during this film. If you want to <laughs> believe that or not, I outside was. of the first twenty minutes, like that real shitty Harvard thing that I didn't enjoy. Outside of that, I was never bored. I'm very like I was, by that. I was interested in what was gonna happen next, even if it took a long time to get there. Like it does a great job of showing its hand very early. Like you get that John Hurt sequence where you know, or at least Chris Christopherson knows that shit is gonna hit the fan. And the whole film, when you're getting to know these people and their relationships and their struggle and how hard it is to till the land and and these people getting shot and their cows uh, like robbed and all this stuff all the while i'm thinking when's the death list going to happen when are they going to die how are they going to die and it, it might have not culminated in a great way that i thought was important like maybe well, if it the, took a very realistic approach to it which it i appreciate did, that but i but mean it, you know, it, it was it felt especially unimportant because yeah. there was no connection to anybody but I, th- that's where I take issue. There's there's a lot here outside of just, you know, the roller rink that I enjoy. There, there's, like, a real funny sequence involving wallpaper. Um, there's probably one of the more realistic portrayals of rape I've ever seen on camera. Oh, um, there, there's just a, a lot here that... You know, Fucking John Locke from Lost is in this. Uh, yeah, which I don't. I don't know who he was. I saw his name in the he, credits, and I was like, "Oh shit!" He's he f- plays one of the uh, one of the the mob men that are part of the association. Did he have hair? Yeah, that's why I couldn't tell. Yeah, it, it like you have to look look at him. It's mm-hmm. like you know he also played the baddie and the stepfather. But yeah, like I I realized I was like, who the fuck is? This? I was like, oh, it's John Locke. Um, but there's like a baseball scene in here that just proves that Ridiculous Six is wrong, that baseball existed before then. Uh, uh, but I, there's like this real, when, when Chris Christopherson and Christopher Walken, they have that, their first scene together, it's shot in deep focus, and there's a juggler outside the window in the background, like training to, you know, entertain kids, and it, it, is, it gave me like a, a Susan Kane feel to it. It's like, here's the foreground, the middle ground, and the background, you can see it all at the same time, and what's important. And oh, yet except it was, Citizen Kane had a far more engrossing scene when that was happening. It's it's a better movie, okay? But I it's a great movie. I, I'm like the opposite of you on this one. I saw yeah. it. I don't know if I ever have to see it again, but I probably will. But I can talk about this movie now in a way other than oh yeah, isn't that the movie that fucking destroyed the Deer Hunter's career? That, that that's that movie, right? The movie that destroyed Hollywood for a couple of years. And instead, I can say, oh, no, that's the real interesting movie that no one gave a shit about until the director died. And it's important for other historical reasons other than its production. And I'm sure just in the way that line producers work now and how budgets are set up. But also, Mm -hmm. like, animals died on the set of this movie on Mm -hmm. camera. And this kind of forced the ASPCA to get involved with Hollywood and PETA, for that matter. uh, Because there's, like, real you know cow entrails and like those are actual <laughs> dead cows and shit like this and it's not cannibal holocaust in that no, way and this isn't like the first time we've seen it, it um, yeah it, it is a, has some serious yeah shit in it. but this is in modern filmmaking the mm-hmm. one that you know it was the last straw this it, it, it forced the hand of hollywood to take those things into consideration and I think it's just a very, very important movie. I can't buy it for a dollar just because 
how much of a time suck it is and how little you walk away with at, with at the end of the day despite it being a true story like this is an important hist- uh, historical event that no one talks about it's kind of been overshot but I think there's enough here even if I didn't love all of it that like I would watch this again like if TCM yeah. had this on their programming I would be interested in what like you know Ben Mankiewicz had to say about it absolutely yeah um, I mean I I can't say this is a total failure. It's just, you know, this is one of those cases where I just think, like, I I would definitely see this again. It's just a first Mm -hmm. viewing is not necessarily one that really resonated with me. Like, and I could find that there's a lot more going on on a character front. I would I would love that, but I mean that is my first entry point into any movie whatsoever. So naturally, that is where my criticisms fall if it's not there. But yeah, like I, I, I seriously, I, I just, I really want to give this more credit because there is a lot of impressive things happening here technically, and I've, I've said this over and over again. Like, yeah, I, I think, like, yeah, just the setting and just the conflict in general. Like, there is, if, if the characters were stronger, then this is the perfect setting for just a great story and. I didn't get what I would hope, especially after, because it's like, it's not necessarily the slowest or anything that I mind. It's just, there's very little substance here, at least not as much as Deer Hunter. Then again, maybe I need to see Deer Hunter again and I'll find that I'll hate that too. I don't maybe. know. I, I hope not. But, um, I mean, yeah, just all the thing back on that movie, like, especially with uh, j- just them all singing at the end of that movie, like, there are just so many more powerful emotional beats with very little things being said and here i just, just think that's missing but they're then again, very I think different movie... movies i don't think they're even fair to compare because you gotta yeah. remember deer hunter that had like no budget at all it was probably the whole thing was like five million uh, of their money and this was him trying to do a victory lap like oh you gave i, I won the awards you know i'm amazing let me show you what i can really do when i have the ability to and I didn't. I don't think he failed at doing that. No, I, I think that I, I this is think... one of the more impressive productions I've ever seen. Like I've yet to see any other film, whether that be an epic or you know a small indie, that can create a world of this size that's believable. And you might not love all the characters in it. You might not yeah. care for any of them. But I believe that this was real. I believe that this was 1890s Wyoming everything about it and that's what's important to me here that it feels like a historical document that in the same way you know if you watch singles or fucking (laughs) uh, like mall rats Mm -hmm. it gives you a true sense of what the 80s are like in or the 90s rather in um in seattle or the 90s in a in like a, a mall in middle america like it gives you that feel you just watch you're like i got it it's there in the way like a john hughes movie does it that this feels like that it feels like it more than gone with the wind feels like you know it's in the south during the civil war or more so than 2001 feels like it's in space like i i don't know how they did it but it it if it wasn't for the r-rated aspects here this would make a perfect movie to show during like seventh grade history when you're learning about the wild west and things of that nature because it's not a western in how you know stagecoach or Silverado is, but it's just as important, and it's a lesser story. But the production, it, it, it just it surpasses anything else. Like it was nominated for one Oscar, and it was art mm-hmm. design, and it lost, which <laughs> flabbergasts me. Yeah, which that's just absolutely that's just the Academy going. Oh, we don't like that movie, so screw this. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you like this show and you want to hear more of our wonderful voices on a weekly basis. Check out Two Cents, a recap of what's happened in film, TV, and tech news. We're also on the titular Dollar Review Show, a spoiler-free critique of new releases or anything we've discovered on our own, whether that be TV, music, etc. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. And we're also on Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, TuneIn, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, just about anywhere on the internet with hours of content available to you for free. But for those of you that feel that the show is worth your dollar, you can send us a donation at patreon.com slash dollarreviews. Contributions not only earn our undying love, but they also make it possible for us to improve our recording equipment and to give you the highest quality episodes possible. 
but more importantly, they'd be helping us acquire the content to review. You know, trips to the multiplex are expensive, and the more donations we receive, the more films we can review for your listening pleasure. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, you'd like to contribute some talking points, send a debt to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis, that's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S, and now you know how to spell the email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site, Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change. <laughs>